What's up, peeps? Welcome back to the Daily Peels video stream of the day. We got a lot to talk about here today, and it's already 9.40 p.m., which means it's approximately an hour and 10 minutes past my bedtime. So we got to hurry this up. We got a lot to get over to get you guys ready for that ticker tape tomorrow. So let's go ahead and get right into things. Of course, shout out to the Boston Bruins for beating the Florida Panthers on Monday. Currently down 3-1 to one right now because these fucking idiots lit up three goals in the second period alone. So we'll see how that goes. Nobody really, I mean, I honestly couldn't care less about Bob Dean about the Celtics, personally myself, and shout out to Jason Tatum right there, my absolute man crush. Anyway, before this gets real weird, let's talk about the weird shit that's going on in artificial intelligence. It was some cryptic tweets coming out over the past couple of weeks and some even more cryptic LLMs that have recently burst onto the scene, so we'll get you guys as updated with that as we possibly can. We'll also be talking about how young Americans need to fucking stop complaining, shut up, and work harder because they're doing better economically than they think that they are. It's time to fucking get off my lawn and whatever the fuck. Make money, I, get, I really don't know anymore. But we're going to talk about it in a quick second. Uh, you know, hope everybody's portfolios are doing well, as always, here too. But let's go ahead and just dive right into the news of the day. Of course, want to make sure that you're ready for the trading tomorrow and that your returns are as good as... Well, hopefully they're way better than mine are. I mean, it's it's pretty hard to be as shitty as mine are. So, you know, we'll just leave that aside for now. But anyway, let's talk about some of the actual important stuff going on in the world. And so, first and foremost, most important, pretty much the only important thing that we're actually going to be talking about today is the fundraiser for Lee Lucanis III. This is the recent, uh, the Bank of America associate who recently and very tragically passed away. He was also a Green Beret in the United States military and served for over 10 years for our country. This is a phenomenal person, and we are very glad to be kind of, uh, you know, helping out to lead this fundraiser. Now, there was some big news related to the fundraiser in the past couple of days, especially with uh, individuals like Bill Ackman, as well as the, what, let me let me look at his name once again. I'm going to butcher his last name, but Brian Carosielli, he is the head of global credit trading at Bank of America. Both of these guys were kind enough to donate $10,000 each to this fundraiser, so Shout out to those guys. I mean, they're really voting with their dollars with how they feel and what kind of people that they are. So obviously we love to see that. Now, questions remain on whether Leo's boss and his firm, Bank of America overall, are actually going to donate. doesn't seem like it at this point because they haven't yet so far, but plenty of other people have. So thank you to everybody who has donated or has even considered donating. It means the absolute world to us and their family as well. So, you know, obviously we just love to see that stuff going on. And thank you guys for anybody else that considers donating into the future. Now, of course, it's very crude to talk about anything following something like this, but uh, we'll, we'll continue. I mean, the, the old saying in showbiz is the show must go on, but, you know, at this point, it's, uh, it seems a little ridiculous. Anyway, the Alpha portfolio suffering pretty heavily on the D, down about 44 basis points compared to the S&P 500, 0.00% return on that day. It wasn't unchanged, but it was just less than one bit. So, you know, doesn't really fucking matter. Nobody actually cares. The Nasdaq was down on the day, but slightly less than we were, bringing our total return to 8.24% for the year, meaning we are, God, it pains me to say, it's still underperforming both of these indexes. I say still because we've been doing it for the past two days. We had been outperforming the S&P for quite a long time, but then Builders First Source and Disney completely fucked us by coming out with their earnings report, falling victim to the uh, casual or, you know, common trap of publicly traded companies are just being way too damn honest. So RIP to us for that. But anyway, we'll be back. We'll be back on top soon enough. Just go ahead and stay tuned and make sure to subscribe to WSO Alpha to stay up to date with all of our research as well. We actually just published a 26-page research report on Enphase Energy. So if you're interested in the energy sector, renewables, EV charging, any kind of bullshit like that, go ahead and check that out. Be sure to sign up for WSO Alpha. Get it on the Discord too. It's fucking been popping off lately, so it's been a lot of fun. Anyway, Going on into some of the other banana bits that we have here today. Looks like companies have finally realized what we realized quite a long time ago, and that is most other streaming services are going to need to come to some kind of bundling deal in order to compete with Netflix. And that's exactly what Warner Bros. Discovery and Disney announced yesterday. They're going to be kind of packaging the Disney+, Plus, Hulu, Warner Bros. Discovery, like, brands together, apparently. I don't really know. It's kind of a complicated deal structure, but go ahead and check that out. It's on TNBC, so it's free, fortunately. Finally, uh, Toast, the payment processor Toast, not the shit that you eat for breakfast in the morning, absolutely crushed it on that earnings report. Most payment processors, especially those like Affirm and some of the others that have reported already, have absolutely plummeted following their earnings report, but Toast was completely killing it. I mean, it makes sense. Every single time I've gone to a restaurant since I've been 
sentient. It feels like they've been asking me to pay with a toast machine. So can't really say that I'm too surprised, but it's a very interesting case study in terms of market returns in that regard. Anyway, you know, the exact opposite way, <laughs> we have ARM. This is the large semiconductor firm or semiconductor design firm that's based out of the UK. Why anything would want to be based out of the UK is more than beyond me, but ARM, they beat on earnings, had a very strong quarter, but not strong enough for what analysts were expecting, so shares dumped more than 9% after hours. Finally, FTX, the scumbag of the century so far. Mr. Sam Bankman fried and his absolute scam company that he was running for quite some time. Turns out that this scam isn't necessarily, I don't want to say it's not as bad, but you know, in the end, a lot of the people that they completely robbed blind are actually going to be made whole and get fully reimbursed, very unlike the likes of uh, Bernie Madoff and people like that. So that's largely the reason for why SBF got such a lower sentence than people like Madoff did, that and the total dollar amount that he completely stole from the public, both in the United States and abroad. Uh, but still, it's always good to see that these people aren't going to be totally financially destroyed for the rest of their lives. Let, I think I've told this story before when I was buying a mattress and the woman that was selling me the mattress said that she had lost all of her money with Bernie Madoff and now basically was never going to get to retire ever again. So it's good to see that FTX isn't that bad. Maybe blockchain really does fix this. I mean, if the first thing that blockchain fixes is fraud and scams, maybe that's a pretty good thing. I mean, that, that's a good starting point, at least. You know, there have been far worse in the past. So, I mean, we'll take what we can get at this point. Anyway, let's go ahead and focus up. Let's get into the Macro Monkey big story news of the day. This one is called Could Be Worse. Everything could be worse pretty much all the time, but especially the economic conditions for young people in the United States of America. Now, most of the people in this cohort have a way harder time naming the continents of the world than naming the Kardashian sisters, and they wonder why they're not doing too well economically. I mean, it's no fucking surprise knowing data like this, but if we actually dive into the data that was released from the Center for American Progress over the past couple of days, we can start to see that the scenario isn't actually as bad as we thought it might be. Now, I should mention the Centers for American Progress, or CAP, which is the very ironic acronym for this uh, extremely left-leaning firm. I say extremely, it's not actually extreme. It's it's pretty strongly left-leaning, but hey, I mean, numbers are numbers. They can't really, well, they definitely can lie, depending on how you present them. But either way, it, the data is pretty solid. We checked into the sources behind them, and they had the much prettier charts on this website. So that's why we're attributing the uh, source to this website that actually published those charts. So what we're talking about here today is the explosion in wealth that young people in the United States have seen since the fourth quarter of 2019, aka since before the pandemic came in and either destroyed your entire life, made you a millionaire, whatever the fuck happened to you during those like 36 or whatever months or so. So we already knew kind of at the beginning that young people were the biggest beneficiaries of the COVID-19 pandemic. Most of that is largely due to having better immune systems than all these old fucks out there, but I don't want to speak ill of the elderly anymore. <laughs> but so what we effectively saw was from about 1990 until the fourth quarter of 2019, the average wealth of young Americans. And by the way, young Americans here is defined as Americans under the age of 40, which is completely ridiculous to me. It's like calling Coca-Cola like a healthy soda or what I said in the piece was it's like calling Tesla value stock. It's I mean, it's completely fucking wrong to consider somebody 40 as young. I, I'm sorry if I'm alienating a lot of our audience here right now. At 24 years old, that does not make a whole lot of sense to me. And it's not necessarily because of their age, but it's because of the time of economic opportunity that you've had. Assuming we all begin at either 18 or 22 years old, there's a big difference in being age 30 versus age 40 because you have an entire fucking decade to build off of right then. Regardless... Uh, that already kind of makes these results moot, but we still want to talk about it because I need these fucking young people to get off my lawn that I wish I had. Anyway, it's it's very clear there is a discrepancy between how young Americans feel and how their finances are telling them that they actually are right now. So between 1990 and Q4 of 2019, the average adjusted wealth for young Americans, adjusted for inflation, basically didn't move at all. It was sitting somewhere around the $174,000 mark. Now, I don't even have anywhere close to that in my bank accounts and especially not in my portfolios. So clearly this is being pulled up by a lot of those outliers that are going to be, you know, older people pulling up that average. But uh, it really didn't move from 1990 until about 2019. We've seen a very different dynamic in the post-pandemic days right now. So according to CAP or the Centers for American Progress, that is so damn funny that it's called CAP. But uh, according to CAP, 
The average wealth of those Americans has grown by about 49% in the interim period since Q4 of 2019. Huge explosive growth like no other cohort saw and like we have never seen in the past. Completely dominated everybody else and took young Americans to a brand new financial standing. The next closest was those 70 years and older and they saw their wealth grow by about 15%. Now most of this is largely attributable to equity market returns. The stock market over that same period is up about 46.85% or so. Uh, so obviously that's going to be a big driver of it. You can see they do make a distinction in some of these charts that we included in the piece between liquid assets and other financial assets. So other financial assets, think retirement accounts, because most of the time that's not going to be considered liquid, even though you can generally go ahead and access it. You're just going to have to pay some kind of a penalty, usually about 10% if you're under the age of 59 and a half. It's my old financial advisory knowledge coming into play right there. But um, so that was the single biggest driver for the growth in wealth of this young Americans cohort. The second biggest is going to make you shit your pants. It was somehow housing wealth. No idea how that's even possible, but I guess people that are over the age of like 28 or something, it's pretty reasonable for you to be owning a home before 2019. Maybe that home appreciated quite strongly in value. Actually, we know that they all did because I'm trying to buy a house right now and it's completely fucking ridiculous. Anyway, we can talk about my problems for hours and hours on another video, but for now, we just need to talk about all of this stuff. I mean, the other big factor here is that we know that low wage earners, they saw their earnings increase the most out of any other cohort during this period. And we're talking on a percentage basis, of course, by the way. And who earns low wages? Young people, baby, me and you. I mean, uh, assuming you're a young person as well, which you probably are if you're watching this video. But we are the ones that are out here earning those low wages. So we saw quite a lot of percentage benefit uh, from the pandemic and from the kind of economic recourse that occurred afterwards. But if you're making $15 an hour, you know, before the pandemic, then you're making $25 an hour following the pandemic, that might be like a 66.67% increase. But, you know, it's a hell of a lot better to me making, you know, $200 an hour and then start making $250 an hour, even though that's only going to be a 25% increase. Obviously, that is a hell of a lot better. So we're talking about percentage terms here. The biggest, uh, I mean, the big takeaway from reading through something like this is that Yes, young Americans are doing better than most people feel or express on the internet, but we absolutely are still able to be fucking pissed, especially about this housing market, because that is basically the one asset class or the one kind of the one asset that young people are going to be trying to buy that has outperformed their overall earnings during that period. We can still see that home prices are up about 6.4% over the past 12 months, according to the Case Shiller Index. Now, I'm pretty sure Case Shiller is talking about home price increases from fucking 2006. But either way, uh, that's kind of the data that we have. That's the situation that we're in right now. It certainly could be worse. There's a lot of complaining going on, but our wealth is appreciated pretty strongly. So, you know, as always in economic situations, it's never going to be as good as it seems or as bad as it seems. People are never as dumb as you expect or as smart as you expect them to be. So, you know, it's always somewhere in the middle. And that's basically what we're talking about here today. Explosion in wealth, but not necessarily commensurate to exactly what young people are looking for. Plus, when you say young people, I mean, I think it's like young to me is like under this might sound ridiculous, especially if you ask me again in six years or so. But young to me sounds under 30. Personally, that's what I would consider young. But maybe I'm wrong. Let me guys know in the comments down below which you consider to be young. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on into the stock movers of the day. First and foremost, we have Reddit. This is Reddit's first official earnings report since going public a few short weeks ago. The company absolutely killed it. They were up 4.1% on the day. And if you count adjusted profits as profits, which I definitely don't, but I kind of allude to in the peel here, it was their first profitable period on record uh, since 2005. They're founding up in Medford, Massachusetts. Shout out once again to fucking Boston, baby. But uh, it was their first profit since being founded in about 2005, 19 years or so from that period. Now, that's excluding one-time adjustments. If we include those one-time adjustments, they definitely weren't even close to profitable, uh, but they still would have lost less than analysts had been expecting. Revenue of $243 million, This grew 49% compared to last year. Most of that is going to be attributable to artificial intelligence trading licensing contracts that they sent to companies like, well, they didn't disclose, but we all know it's fucking Google at this point. Now, users beat, free cash flow beat. Quite honestly, it was very good news all around, showing that the IPO frenzy that Reddit enjoyed wasn't all for nothing. Moving on down below, we have Anheuser Busch InBev. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Some German, I'm sure, can correct me. Call me a. Uh, I'm actually not going to do a German accent. Uh, anyway, 
you know, the good thing about looking at a company like AB InBev is that their ticker symbol is Bud. So it almost makes you feel like you have friends. At least that's what it does for me. And we saw that Bud was my personal biggest friend yesterday, rising about 4% on the day. The company destroyed earnings expectations. Yes, Bud Light sales are still a little bit lower than they typically would be. But ever since Shane Gillis brought those back a couple of months or maybe even a year ago at this point, uh, ever since Shane Gillis made sure the Bud Light was certified back, it has been performing much stronger on a quarter-over-quarter quarter sequential style basis. Now, we did say the company beat on earnings, absolutely destroyed with $0.41 cents a share versus the $0.23 cents a share that was expected on $14.5 billion in sales versus $14.4 billion that was expected. Keep going out there and drinking and buy some goddamn Bud Light. Let's go ahead down below. Shopify shit its fucking pants on a day down 18.6% because as Amazon's little brother, they weren't necessarily able to uh, get quite the appreciation in the post-pandemic or kind of post-post-pandemic. I, I mean, at this point, my economic theory is that we're starting to reach a period that is called post-post-pandemic, when we're reacting to the post-pandemic dynamics and everything that was going on during that period. Think things like high inflation, think things like uh, extremely low, historically low unemployment. We can get into that a whole nother day. But Shopify, once again, down 18.6% on the day. Wasn't necessarily because of anything that they did, but kind of uh, the, the shoe was on the other foot compared to Reddit here. So one-time charges took this firm to a loss for the quarter, which was very surprising to analysts. Now, basically what the firm reported in terms of non-GAAP earnings was $0.20 cents per share versus $0.17 cents per share that was actually expected. So Obviously, they beat in that regard, but it's bullshit earnings. Would we actually go ahead and take out the one-time charges that they're talking about? It was a loss of $0.21 cents per share. Analysts, you know, it's a smart bunch. They had expectations for, and once you removed those charges, that the company would still make roughly about $0.09 cents per share for the quarter. Completely fucked that. Couldn't have been more wrong. They actually more than doubled that in terms of the losses. So, Rough quarter on the bottom line for Shopify, but revenue still grew 23%, so they can't necessarily be too upset. However, going forward, they did make sure to punch analysts in the space and fucking spit on their hands before shaking their hand and walking out of the earnings call here today because management did go ahead and say that they expect high teens growth going into the next quarter. Now, analysts had been expecting about 19% growth going into the quarter, which technically is high teens, but when you say high teens, we all know that means like 15 16% or so. Otherwise, you would have said almost 20% growth. Now, that's how these companies work. Sign up for the quarter app if you, you know, want to kind of get a better sense of that behavioral or uh, psychological side of things, I guess. Anyway, final stock of the day, we have Uber Technologies. And we actually just dropped a video breaking this down, so be sure to go ahead and check that out if you're not sick of seeing my ugly mug just yet. But Uber was down about 5.7% of the day. Speaking of ugly, that's a, a fucking disgusting. But the shares tanked on very weak numbers. Now, it was pretty weak just about across the board. So the company also swung to a surprise loss. Most of that was due to charges related to losses in their investment portfolio for the period. Obviously, that doesn't necessarily affect their operations. But what it does do is speak to management and kind of what they're thinking about the company going forward. It's clear that management and executives haven't accepted that Uber is moving out of its growth stage and into a maturing company where they should be focused on cost controls and free cash flow generation. Uh, the company does pretty well on the free cash flow side. They could do a lot better if they actually got this shit under control, in my opinion, at the very least. But that's not what happened in the last quarter. While Spotify, Netflix, these companies that kind of grew up alongside Uber seem to be having a, a much better time kind of adjusting to life in the adult world of corporate America, Uber is a bit more rebellious of the group. Uh, like I said, they did swing to a surprise loss. Go ahead and check out our other video. I don't want to step on our content anymore. Anyway, let's finish up with one of the weirdest fucking things that I've ever written in quite a long time. So you're going to be creeped out by the header for the Thoughtman. And it says, I'm a good daily peel writer. And it has hyphens in between. And no, I'm not all of a sudden becoming some narcissistic fuck who has to self-affirmate all the time. But some weird shit was going down earlier this week. The amount of things that I find on Twitter after I finish writing the Daily Peel makes me want to fucking stick my head in the sand and choke all over it because it's just uh, like I, I'm, lying at, I'm lying in bed at like midnight basically scrolling through X because I'm addicted to my phone and I can't put it away. And I start to see these things that are like, oh my God, this artificial intelligence bot is doing this. Elon Musk, Sam Altman is doing that. Like what? It's blowing my mind quite honestly. And so... I was very excited to write about this from the moment that I went to bed last night. So Rowan Chung, this is a great follow on Twitter because the guy is obsessed. I mean, I don't know if he goes outside, quite honestly. Most of the time I'm joking about that, but this time I'm not. This guy is 
phenomenal. He's the gold standard in terms of keeping up with artificial intelligence news. And he made clear to me that there was a new chatbot that had burst onto the scene recently. Or potentially two new chatbots. We don't really know what's going on right now. But one of them is called I'm a good GPT-2 chatbot. And the other is called I'm also a good GPT-2 chatbot. They all have hyphens in between every single one of those names. And nobody knows what the hell is going on here. This thing kind of dropped in secrecy. But if you actually test this large language model, it outperforms ChatGPT4, ChatGPT Turbo, uh, Meta's fucking Llama 3.0, whatever other bullshit is out there, it outperforms it. So everybody was kind of shitting themselves, like, where the hell did this thing come from? But then we look back in the history of Twitter on May 5th at about 4.45 p.m., Mr. Sam Altman tweeted exactly the name of the chatbot. I'm dash also whatever the fuck. Uh, so a lot of people are starting to think this is OpenAI dropping kind of a beta test for ChatGPT5. It also could be the old legacy GPT-2 model with some updates and fine tuning and some new training data on it. Other people think that Sam is just kind of trolling right now. But if you go ahead and look in the piece, there's a screenshot of exactly kind of how it replies to things. Go ahead and play around with it too because we explain exactly how you can get on that and figure it out. Even if you've never seen a damn computer before, you should be able to figure out if I was able to do so. Because as we all know, I'm the worst when it comes to technology and all that bullshit kind of stuff. That's why I'm you know sitting here talking to you guys instead of doing something actually valuable for the world. But the release of this chatbot kind of encompassed or summarized the entirety of the AI space, or at least the philosophy underpinning the artificial intelligence space. It's really, like, it's operating in the dark. It creates this very general feeling of uncertainty, and it's scaring the shit out of all of us, which is the epitome of what artificial intelligence has been so far. I mean, these neural networks, they are literally called black boxes. Hardly anybody knows what's going on in them, and I certainly absolutely do not. It echoes similar sentiments to Satoshi dropping the Bitcoin white paper back in, you know, uh, it was actually Halloween Day in 2008, and I remember that as well because... I remember reading the Bitcoin white paper when I got home from trick-or-treating in my Harry Potter costume when I was in third grade. So, you know, some great times back then for me. My, I thought, I had said at the time, no, I'm a strict value investor. I've been reading Ben Graham for the past seven years, which is how long I had been alive at that point. Uh, but I said, no, I'm a value investor. I go with Ben Graham and he would not buy Bitcoin. So I didn't get it at that point. Shout out to anybody that actually did. Basically, nobody knows what's going on with this chatbot, but it's absolutely ridiculous that it's, outperforming names like ChatGPT, ChatGPT Turbo, Metalama 3, Google's Gemini, pretty much everything that's out there and commercially available. All the market right now gets beat by this no-name, whatever-the-fuck kind of chatbot. Personally, my own theory is that this is a beta test for ChatGPT 5. Occam's razor, right? The simplest solution is often the most accurate, whatever the fuck the actual technical definition of Occam's razor is, but that's basically what we're dealing with right now. So given all that weird shit going on in artificial intelligence, I want to learn you guys a bit of a lesson here. I went ahead and dug deep into the history of the word artificial intelligence because I can't understand how it actually works, but I do somehow understand sentences. So this guy, John McCarthy, he's an old fuck. He was actually born in Boston as well. Shout out to fucking Boston, Massachusetts once again, baby. This is the guy who coined the term artificial intelligence. And one of the most famous quotes that he said in an interview before passing in 2011 is that, if it takes 200 years to achieve artificial intelligence, and then finally there's a textbook that explains how it's done, the hardest part of that textbook to write will be the part that explains why people didn't think of it 200 years ago. Basically saying that, you know, kind of stating the obvious, that the reason we don't know how to create artificial general intelligence right now is going to be the most difficult part of writing a textbook about artificial general intelligence in the future. Makes sense. Uh, pretty profound statement from our boy John McCarthy, fellow Bostonian, fellow technologist, just like me, of course, always coming with these updates. But before I say anything embarrassing or get myself canceled on here, I'm going to go ahead and call it for the day. It is now 10.04 p.m. Holy shit. My mom would be pissed if she knew that I was staying up this late. But either way, shout out to everybody out there. Happy investing, happy trading. Hope you're all having a great day, and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye now.